Welcome everyone to this very special episode. Joining us here is an absolute legend of death metal, Henry from Revenant. Hello, Henry. Hello, Nick. Hello, everyone. You know, anyone who's ever listened to, to death metal, you know, who has even a, a passing interest has heard uh, prophecies of a dying world. Hmm. You know, it's such a, an incredible record. Honestly, one of my favorites in the genre. And, you, you know, w- one thing that surprises me is that I thought the, the band was Floridian because of the, you know, the style, the vocals, the way you, you guys were playing. You weren't quite as uh, chuggy as like a lot of the um, New York bands that came right after you guys. Yeah. I mean, uh, which I'm curious, which bands do you think came after us? Who were the bands that you were thinking about? Uh, I, I'm thinking of the big three in your area. So that's going to be um, Suffocation, Incantation, and Immolation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were contemporary with all of them. Um, um, I was... I, we, we played Immolation's first concert. We played together there. And that is when John McEntee was still in Revenant before he had Incantation. So we were all roughly contemporary, um, except Incantation comes a bit later and maybe Suffocation too. But Immolation and Revenant basically began around the same time, 1987, 1988. Um, but you're right. Yeah, we were different in many ways. Uh, Revenant was closer to the band Ripping Corpse um, than some of the other New York area bands uh, in the sense that we just had some different influences. But uh, I appreciate the thoughts. And let me just respond to what you said earlier. Can I do that for a moment? Yes, of course. Go for it. When, when, you, when you say that you regard prophecies and you know some of the other revenant music that we made, especially in that later period from 1990 to 1994. When you say you regard it highly, I just want to say thank you. I'm I'm very flattered by that. Um, what many people don't know or appreciate, even if they've heard it, is the fact that as much as I loved the band and the scene and still do love all my old friends and when i say love i mean that in the the truest sense of the word with a great passion and respect for the people and the music uh when i left that band it was very it was very difficult for me um i just had a long talk with john mcintee from incantation about this and he expressed similar feelings uh revenant was our lives for a very long time for me longer than most And when I walked away from it, I made a decision to channel my creative energy, my work into something else. And I had to walk away and it took me a few years to adjust. And I walked away from it thinking, well, we're going to vanish like like a ghost, right? And we'll be, I mean, this scene, nobody in the early to mid nineties thought that we, any of us would be here a quarter century later talking about this music. And because I walked away, most of my friends are still in the music scene. Immolation is still playing, Cannibal Corpse is still playing. Um, So many of them stayed after it. I'm incredibly proud of them. They've accomplished so much. But for someone who walked away early on to hear those words come out of your mouth, and I know I'm not speaking only for myself, I'm speaking also for my bandmates. I have to say, I'm, I'm very grateful. I never thought that, you know, at the age of 50, I would be talking about the band any longer with anyone, right? Um, so I'm very grateful and I thank you for that. And, and anyone listening, um, uh, I thank you for just finding something to enjoy in that loud, abrasive, and obscure music that we made because that music was marginal in its era. And I'm glad it has a place somewhere in the canon of extreme music history. I'm very grateful for that. So I'm, I'm done blubbering, please continue. No worries. I mean, you know, Revenant for a lot of people, you know, it's not quite my view 
but everyone kind of a lot of people call you a kind of um, mid thrash mid death metal band like a lot of bands like Sadus, uh, Demolition Hammer, uh, like La Sepultura. I mean, I always considered you guys to be really death metal because, you know, none of your songs go uh, verse one, chorus one, verse two, chorus two, break. Yeah. You know, there's a really advanced sense in terms of the way you arrange those riffs. Hmm. Yeah, so, that's an excellent point. I think that, you know, listeners who, who admire the band and say, we were, you know, thrash, death, a hybrid. I think they have a point about a certain period in the band's history. Um, from 1989 to, you know, the release of Prophecies, let's say for two, two and a half years, we were still growing out of certain influences. If you listen to some of the later music, and I'm thinking here of the Exalted Being 7-inch, that was just uh, released in the 10 Inches of Death series on Extreme Records. If you listen to those songs, The Burning Ground, Exalted Being, you can hear more, at least sonically, there's more of a death metal sound. The vocals are more guttural, the guitars are more distorted, the riffing is more of a death metal style riffing. But I think that the music the band is primarily known for fits that. One of the difficult things when I look back at the band is just simply trying to categorize what the hell we were doing. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the song structures early on are fairly primitive, right? So if, if I understand your, your question, and it's an excellent point, the song structures set us apart and you're right about that. I would attribute that sort of formal experimentation to a few influences. Um, first, I would say that in my own life, I was very much influenced by progressive rock um, and some of the longer compositions of rock bands like The Doors I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of Pink Floyd, Rush, yes, bands like this, and even Led Zeppelin to some degree, where you had these more elaborate song structures. Um, that was certainly something that we aspired to in our own underground kind of way where we were burrowing into these longer structures and more technical experimental style. Um, at times, we could also simplify it, but you're right. For the most part, the band was structurally distinct from most, even if the sound was a thrash death hybrid. Um, formally, in terms of composition, we were a bit different. And I would really attribute that to the progressive rock influences on our music and our interest in some of the more experimental stuff. One, one thing that people don't realize is that we played with nearly every underground band and we were listening to everything. Um, during that time, whether it was the grindcore bands like Brutal Truth or Napalm Death, or if it was, you know, progressive rock that we were listening to, or if we were playing with hardcore or death bands or thrash bands. Uh, you mentioned Demolition Hammer. They were a local band. I saw them play. Um, so there were a lot of influences, but structurally, yes, we were distinct. I think there was something pretentious about it at times, but at some times it also worked quite well. I'm, I'm proud of some of those arrangements, especially um, on the Prophecies record. They just, there aren't, there. you can look around at other metal from that period, any metal, and it's, you'd be pretty hard put to find music that was as structurally distinct as the music that Revenant made. That also prevented us from being more accessible, but that's not something you think about, we were thinking about. Um, at the time. Yeah, and you know, one thing that strikes me, because you know, you play a lot of kind of like these uh, short melodies, kind of almost oriental styled, you know, I'm thinking especially about the this kind of break on the first track on the prophecies, um, the, the eponymous song, this kind of mm -hmm. arabesque melody. And it's quite funny because Chuck Schuldiner with Death became known for that way later than you. So, so where did that come from, you know? 
Um, no, it's there. It's it's actually there. Chuck was the master of those riffs. But if you listen closely to Scream Bloody Gore, it, there's some of it there already. Um, I'm thinking of Zombie Ritual, the opening riff of Zombie Ritual. The song Zombie Ritual was a riff. To this day, I still listen to it and it just does something to my blood. It, 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 <laughs> That riff is is fantastic. It's one of my favorite riffs. And that was a very influential album in some ways uh, for me and for John McEntee when we were still in the band together. Um, you know, John, before he left to form Incantation, he was in Revenant for two, two and a half years. Um, and we attended the first death tour. Um, I saw their, their first tour. Um, and, um, I saw the leprosy tour, the spiritual, I saw all th the three first tours. And I think I saw them on the fourth national tour with when they toured with sacrifice and gore fest. So I saw all of the early death lineups and tours from, you know, the, the classic lineup to that's, you know, Rick and Bill and those guys to the, the more technical lineup they had later on with Gene and Steve from Satis. Um, and that's an interesting point. Those, those riffs that you point out were definitely inspired by some of those melodic moments in the death songs. Um, they were a big influence on me as I was learning to play the guitar. I would play those riffs all the time. And I thought, hmm, Maybe I can find some way to, you know, transmute this into something of my own. And I did occasionally the the opening riff of Prophecies of a Dying World, which actually I didn't write. That was Dave Django's. Dave came up with that riff. He was very good at writing those kinds of riffs as well. And he was also responsible for a lot of the harmonies. So if you listen to the opening riff of Distant Eyes, that is a harmony that Dave came up with. Um, and that's a similar a riff similar to the one you're talking about. Um, we didn't always structure our songs around riffs like that, but they did add a texture um, that, uh, you know, just set us apart. They appear at weird moments, whether at the beginning or if you listen to a song like, um, there's a, actually my favorite one is on the Overman EP. In the middle of that song, there's a beautiful riff that Dave put together where just the two guitars and the riffs just keep elaborating or we keep elaborating them and layering the riffs until you, they all come together. And then there's a vocal part, it's very climactic. Uh, so there are moments in the music um, where you see those kinds of riffs. You use the word oriental uh, I wonder, I always wondered where that came from. You don't hear a lot of, you know, uh, Asiatic or Oriental influences in metal, but it, it's, it's always been there in rock history. If you listen back even to the Beatles, you find these weird moments where they pluck from other musical traditions. And I always wondered how that seeped into some of those riffs like Chuck's and ours, um, where you had those moments. Um, and of course, now you have bands playing this music all over the world and integrating their own cultural musical elements. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that was a conscious decision to write something that sounded exotic in that way, but it just sounded good and we played it and hell, it worked. Um, that's a great question. I've never been asked that question and I really appreciate it. It really shows that you've been listening to the music uh, very carefully. Uh, we needed more listeners like you when we were younger, the band might have survived. <laughs> I mean, you, you'd be surprised. Sometimes I talk to kids and then I'm like, wait, you are minus 10 years old when this album was released. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I'm screwed. They were, they, were, they were only a potential. But to, with that being said, on that topic, you know, when we formed Revenant 1986, 1987, we were teenagers. You know, um, I was the age of, 
you know, Max from Sepultura is closest to me in age. We were very young. So most of these guys were older. When I met the guys in Morbid Angel, I thought they were old men. Like they were 10 years older than me, I think. Uh, I was 15, 16, seven. I think I was 17 when I met the, the guys in Morbid Angel. And I remember thinking to myself, well, these are adults. That's why they know what they're doing. I'm just a teenager. I'm just making noise, right? Um, so it's everything is embryonic at some point. Um, and, you know, I think it's the quality of your range, not just you, but any careful listener. What do we listen for when we listen to music? How do we listen to music? It's the quality of the interpretation that matters. Anyone can like music, right? Um, you can say, well, I like it. Well, that's just an opinion. Do you have something specific and valuable to add, some comment, some interpretation that is persuasive and elegant? Well, that, that sets you apart, I think. I've been reading through your website, Nick, and I, I've just been really, really impressed with the quality of the reviews there. And like I said, we, we didn't make music for people who had these advanced tastes like you do. We just made music. But it turns out over time that the people who appreciate our music to this day are those careful, attentive listeners. Because you have to admit, Revenant, for the most part, was a very demanding band to listen to. Yeah, I mean, right? it's 55 minutes, which, which you know, I, I'm not sure if you listen to many modern death metal bands, yeah. But like it's 31, 32 minutes kind of Slayer like format nowadays. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's always a huge surprise whenever I go back to prophecies. Um, even Exalted Being is, is very difficult despite being what, 10, 11 minutes from what I remember. And Overman's like 17. Yeah, 17 minutes. Uh, that Overman EP was four songs. And those were four short songs by our standards. Exactly. Um, uh, they were they all came in under five minutes um and there was there was a there's a set of songs that we didn't finish we ran out of money for the studio um a trilogy of songs that should have been included there that one of the songs was only two minutes long uh so those were different that later material was much different uh, we were a very restless band in terms of our approach to composition. We always wanted to try different things. So from the early primitive composition style, which was very mimetic, you know, we were copying bands like Voivod and Celtic Frost and um, Slayer material like that to the more later, more, let's say, I don't, I don't want to use the word symphonic, let's just say the more complex structures of the middle period. And then later, it's still some of those songs, like you mentioned, Exalted Being, The Burning Ground, where you have, I think, more of a balance between technical difficulty and brevity, right? Mm. Uh, I think that there's just an arc of different influences and changes that happen to the band so that, you know, it's very difficult to categorize, back to your original question, to categorize Revenant in some ways. There's a little bit of everything in there, um, but we did mature later on and that period you're talking about showed that we were just experimenting. Um, and I would say that that was true of many of the New York area bands. I'm not sure if the New York scene gets enough credit uh, for the range of different styles and influences that were evident in that music. Uh, it, the New York scene was as vibrant and dynamic and, and complicated as any of the big underground scenes of that era. In retrospect, we can look at a band like Immolation and say, well, you know, this is a cornerstone of death metal music, right? Like they wrote one of the chapters of the book for how to make death metal, right? <laughs> but at the time, they were just as experimental and new and interesting as anyone else, right? So it was, it was, it's a question of how their longevity has influenced our perception. 
And that's important to consider. Today, immolation is an institution. Suffocation is an institution in that scene. In 1990, when we were all young and playing together, we didn't have a sense of that. We were just doing what we did and riffing off of each other and making music and just getting in the van and driving to places. So it's, um, it's a much, you know, history is a crazy thing. We can, we can see it through a kind of a broken glass or a broken mirror in retrospect. And what was actually clear at one point is a bit fractured. Um, and that's the beauty of history. And when it comes to music, especially death metal music, it has a really amazing history. And I'm, I'm very, I feel very fortunate to be part of that. Um, and I was, I spoke recent, I went to see a Malaysian play recently. I, I still go out to shows when I can. Well, before this could. pandemic. Yeah. And, um, and we, we were talking about this, like, you know, I told them, I said, I'm incredibly proud of you. It's amazing that you've lasted this long and, you know, have found a way to, to live on your music. It's, it's a wonderful thing. I don't think any of us would have thought that. Um, we were all working jobs and, you know, we all had to support ourselves. The music wasn't enough. <laughs> we couldn't play shows and do big tours on an extensive basis. If we did, they were you know, relatively short and the, the money you made wasn't enough to last you until the next tour, right? So that's, that's an amazing thing. Um, Nick, I really appreciate that question though. Thank you. What else do you want to talk about, man? You, you know what? There's, Can I ask you a question? Yeah, go for it. What are those guitars behind you? Um, one of them is, one of them is, um, my cheap Ibanez, and the other one is a bass I inherited. <laughs> I tend to inherit, inherit guitars from a lot of people who stop playing music. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I, um, before I went, I was living in New York City in the early 2000s, and then I moved to North Carolina. And before I moved, I was going through the things at my parents' house and I did what you just described. Um, I, I bestowed on an old friend a guitar that I didn't need any longer. I found it in my parents' house. It was an old Kramer. It was a shark fin kind of knockoff that I used as a backup guitar in Revenant. And I gave it to Roger from Mortician. Well, I gave it to Will Raymer um, because they had lost some of their gear or stuck in Europe. And... Uh, I gave one of those guitars away because I knew that, that he needed something uh, to get him over un, you know, to get him by until he recovered his equipment. Um, so I'm one of those people who has given away guitars. Maybe I should give you my BC Rich. I still have my my the famous purple red BC Rich uh, that I used to record the Revenant albums. It's sitting in storage here. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a that's an iconic guitar you know yeah well thank you um i'll send you that shirt and then we'll see what happens <laughs> you know one thing that always um surprised me and i'm kind of sad that in many ways revenant didn't break out because i think uh the drummer will his sense of like the way he dressed like he didn't care he didn't wear black shirts he was like drumming sometimes you see him with a suit and a tie or whatever i think damn if, if revenant had broken out maybe we would have had like less bands trying to look hard and tough and whatever and all that yeah um you know how can i put this um Will to this day marches to the beat of his own drummer. He he has an inner percussionist when it comes to his sense of style. That is just that's who he is. Um, it was a source of amusement for us when we were in the band. It certainly wasn't a source of embarrassment. It was just hey, that's who he is. One of the wonderful things, and I think you know, and I'll say it out loud something that has always turned me off about any community or scene is any sense of conformity that 
you should look a certain way, you should dress a certain way, you should speak a certain way or behave a certain way. That sort of conformist mindset has irked me my entire life, whether it's in music, whether it's in my other passions, whether it's in my academic work. Um, I find it just so tiresome. And there is an element, and it has always been an element of that. And I will say this, you know, when everyone saw that you could wear jeans and a t-shirt, a Misfits t-shirt on an album cover, and I thank Metallica forever for just jeans, sneakers, and, a, and, a, and an old torn up t-shirt. Well, hell, thank you. You just saved me a lot of money. I don't have to buy leather pants now, right? Um, so I was always a, more of a jeans and t-shirt type. And Will was uh, shorts and slippers and a half shirt type. <laughs> but if you've never met Will, Will was a, an incredibly tall man. He is an incredibly tall man. He's, he towered over us by almost a foot. So for him to just go out and buy clothes, it wasn't a simple thing. Clothes for a man of that size were not easy to find. And on top of that, it was even more difficult to play drums the way he did in any tight fitting clothes, right? So I remember he would buy a pair of long jeans and they would immediately tear at the knees because he was playing drums with them and they'd get sweaty and they'd start to come apart. Um, and, you know, wet jeans, they just split. So Will just gave up and started wearing shorts. Um, and I will say this, among drummers, he wasn't the only one. A lot of drummers of that era, they just wore shorts and no shirt. Like they played basically in their underwear when they were playing that music because it was incredibly hot and you had to have a certain freedom of physical movement to play the style. Playing drums in, a, in any extreme metal band is one of the most difficult jobs on earth. It's incredibly complicated. The, you have to decipher a very challenging environment in terms of sound, right? You have to be able to hear things. You have to you know, be consistently expending tremendous amounts of energy. And you have to be able to suffer through these really hot clubs. So I, you know, Brandon Thomas from Ripping Corpse, another you know, great drummer of that era, uh, he was the same way. He was, you know, shirtless, shorts, you know, and a pair of sneakers on. Um, and Dave Witte from Human Remains, he was also eccentric in his dressing habits, more of a skateboarder look than uh, anything else. Do you know Dave Witte from Human Remains? He plays in Municipal Waste. Do you know the band Municipal yeah, Waste? Yeah, the, the thrash band, yeah. Yeah, he's an amazing drummer. He was one of the local drummers that we used to play with. So um, Will's fashion sense was uh, something else. On the When he showed up for the photo shoot of Prophecies of a Dying World, our friend Chris took those photographs on the George Washington Bridge that connects New York to New Jersey. We went out there on a very cold day in January it must have, I mean, it was, the temperatures were freezing. I remember putting my hand on the bridge of the metal on the bridge and my hand froze to it. My skin instantly <laughs> stuck to the bridge. And here's Will in a half shirt and shorts with a long coat on and it's not buttoned. And his hair was, he just got out of the shower. His hair froze during the photo shoot. I always appreciated his his eccentricity, both as a drummer and a person. And I, I, I celebrate it. I think, I think the world needs more of that. Yeah, you know, um, do you listen to any current death metal? Yeah, mm -hmm. some. You, you know, the, the thing that tends to annoy me is that they're all very, uh, they have this very romantic vision of what the 90s were like. And they try to conform to that stereotype, you know, that you've completely destroyed in the last couple of minutes. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I'm not. I, I listen to a lot of music. I have a friend who 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 who's very much into listening to all the new material, and I and I hear things. I still I go and watch bands, um, you know, that I know. But I'll go watch and listen to bands uh, that I don't know, that I've only heard of, or I, I know very little about them. Um, and I get a sense that there is a mythology around this music, right? There's something imaginative in the way people recreate the history of our scene. Uh, I think that that is something that's inevitable. It can be applauded even. But if it becomes a cage in which your imagination is trapped, then it can be dangerous. And I'm not sure what role that plays in the music that I hear. Some of it's very good, um, but I can't always speak to the quality of, of the, or the integrity of their intentions. And so I can, I, 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 perhaps I can, I can, I think I know what you mean, Nick, when you say that there is a certain nostalgia and nostalgia is, is a two way street. You know, it's, um, it can be, it can be a dangerous element of any imaginative or creative enterprise, because then what happens is you just become a copy of something else, right? Um, who wants to do that? I, I certainly don't, but if, if that's, if that's what is going to eventually clear the path for something original, then sure, go for it. Everyone's a copy, at least in the early stages of any artistic endeavor, you're going to be a copy in some way, but are you going to be a good copy, right? I think of your, your fellow countryman, Charles Baudelaire, right? He read Edgar Allan Poe and he said, my God, this Poe, Edgar Allan Poe is amazing. And then you read Baudelaire's own poetry and you can still hear some of Poe in there, but there's nothing like Baudelaire. He's an, he's an original copy, if that contradiction makes sense. Um, and that's, I think, what you want in music as well. Uh, you don't want just a, a derivative of something else. You know, one thing I really want to ask you about is, um, you know, there's also there's Will's kind of eccentric uh, dress style and, and uh, the aesthetic, but the album cover, you know, now it's a lot of bands have done something like this, but for 91, it it's absolutely insane. Uh, the lyrics, you know, you completely change this kind of notion of a uh, horror stab, die, die uh, lyrics and, uh, you know, fight the wizard and all that. And, you know, you came up with this, you know, just the lyrics and the whole, the whole concept of the planet dying. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I remember being a child in the 90s, and that wasn't like quite as much as a popular subject as it was before uh, Al Gore came out with his uh, documentary. So, I mean, and just everything, I mean, the writing, the sound of the words, because we can hear you very clearly on... Um, prophecies compared to exalted being or overman where you have a lot more grit in your voice but it's just but I don't, how seriously did you take those lyrics because no one was taking their lyrics seriously back then it's insane i mean so, so much <laughs> wordplay <laughs> yeah um okay so where do i begin here um Nick, this is uh, there. There are a couple of avenues or trajectories through which I can approach this question. First of all, about the point about environmentalism or what appears to be a kind of environmentalism, and that album cover and some of the themes in the music. Um, you know, life in. If you lived through the late Cold War, right? And I'm thinking of the period from the 1960s to the 1980s. If you were born, raised, or you know, lived through that era, there was an incredible amount of discussion centered around that topic, right? People, especially here in the United States, began to recognize 
And when I say recognize, I use that word in the, in the, the, the true meaning or sense of the term. They began to think, to cognate, right? That the environment or that there was a a potentially catastrophic relationship developing between human civilization and the environment that it inhabits. So you started to see in the 60s and 70s a very important environmentalist movement. The landmark book is Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, early 1960s, um, in, that brought awareness to chemical pollution of the environment. Um, then the creation under the Nixon presidency of the Environmental Protection Agency, um, which was the culmination of decades of work in environmental conservatism that had begun in the 1930s in the United States. And then, you know, into the 1970s, you started to see more discussion of recycling. There were public service announcements. If you've never seen the famous, it's one of the most famous TV commercials in American history. It's a public announcement showing a Native American man standing on the side of a highway and people are throwing litter out of their cars. And he starts crying. He's in a canoe at one point and the water is full of trash. That was a, a very, very impactful commercial at the time. I remember seeing it as a boy and thinking, my God, how sad. Um, the irony of that is that the actor in that commercial, I always got a kick out of this. He died a few years ago. He was an Italian guy from Louisiana. <laughs> so, you know, to, obviously bad casting, but, you know, he played the part. He was an actor. He did his job. And the, the commercial was very, very, how could I say this? It was very persuasive. So by the early 1980s, you start to see, you know, a stronger anti-nuclear war movement. You start to see Earth Day recycling programs. Suddenly the rivers, the parks, the roads, there's suddenly a lot, they're becoming cleaner. And there's a general sense that all of these different discussions and laws and regulations and policies and changes in behavior are beginning to produce a result. And let me just say, growing up in and around New York City, the scale of the pollution was horrifying. It was absolutely horrifying. In New Jersey, where I grew up as a young boy, you couldn't drive within 20 miles of the Meadowlands, a beautiful natural swamp land or marshland in, in Northern New Jersey without smelling the garbage dump or the oil refineries, or it was just a crazy, you couldn't swim in the rivers without getting sick. We did it anyway, but it was, it was, it was one of these things. Like you, you know, we would go fishing in the creeks or the rivers. You couldn't eat those fish, they were poisonous. Right. So I think at the edge of my mind as a teenager growing up during the late Cold War, there was a sense of, oh, my God, I'm not going to live a long life. The planet is being destroyed. We're constantly on the edge of nuclear exchanging volleys of nuclear warheads with the Soviet Union. Um, we had just come out of the Vietnam War. It was an absolutely, you know, awful experience. I, I have family members served back different people, right, from that war. So, you know, there was always at the edge of anyone's consciousness, if you were paying attention, that the sense that we were going to die and it was going to be pretty ugly when it happened. It was either going to be a quick nuclear incineration or a slow poisoning. Uh, and if you were from New Jersey, you were particularly screwed <laughs> because it was so contaminated, right? Then you have music like, you know, punk and hardcore bands that are taking on social political issues. 
and I'm listening to that music. My bandmates are listening to that music. And on the other hand, you have this new kind of metal that's emerging. It's, it's apocalyptic, right? It's loud. It's, it's dark. So what if you take those two and pair them? Um, I wasn't a punk lyricist. My lyrical influences range from, you know, horror and fantasy fiction to, you know, some of the great French anthropologists. If you've, you know, we have a song title from Claude Levi Strauss. <laughs> I mean, you know, so my influence or philosophers like, you know, the German, like the dark German philosophers, like Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, things like this stuff you read when you're young and impressionable, right? Yeah. So these were my lyrical influences and somehow they, they converged on that record. Lyrically, the album was about, if you listen carefully to Prophecies of a Dying World, there's really only one theme. Uh, a, the protagonist of every lyric or every song is a figure who is trapped in a world of forces that are beyond his control. And he is being tortured, persecuted, harassed, um, etc. And you're in this sort of Lovecraftian position of, you know, incomprehension on a cosmic scale. So there is, you know, a, a mythology at work on that record in those lyrics. But I will say this, we did not choose that album cover. When we saw it, we didn't want it. <laughs> no way. Yeah, so what happened was that the nuclear blast must have heard the record and listened and read through the lyrics and said, okay, we're gonna use this album cover. And they selected a cover to match the, what they thought of the music. We didn't pick that album cover. We didn't, we, we didn't, we never saw the album cover until it came out. And we didn't like it. That album cover, in our view, misrepresented the band. And it, to be totally honest, it was at the time the least metal album cover ever fucking put on a record sleeve. <laughs> right? You pardon me. Can I curse? Is it okay? Yeah, if I of curse? course. Go for it. Okay. Okay. So when we saw that album cover, what happened was that we approached Rob Leacock. Rob Leacock painted the cover of the Ripping Corpse record, Dreaming with the Dead. He had done artwork for us. Uh, he had also done work for Monster Magnet, another New Jersey band that I love very much. And we played with them um, early in our careers. So we wanted Rob to make the album. But the sense was Rob said no. He didn't want to become the guy who was making everyone's albums. And we respected that. Mm -hmm. So we went to another local artist. And he came up with a design that just didn't work for us. It was too cartoonish. So we didn't really know what to do. And then we had to go make the album. We made the record. Yeah, that's a whole other story. And then suddenly Nuclear Blast has an album cover. And we thought, oh my God, this is not the album cover we wanted. The, the font was all wrong. The color scheme, that photograph. You know, it is what it is. It was That album cover was selected as an interpretation of the record. It's bright. It's weird. Maybe they saw something and they were right about it after all. In, in a way, it stands out. It does stand apart. It's not your typical cartoonish uh, album cover. I was thinking yesterday of the artist who did the Sepultura album covers. Um, uh, he, used, he used to make, he painted the covers of the Del Rey editions, the paperback editions of, of H.P. Lovecraft, and then Roadrunner hired him to do the Sepultura album covers. He's a really interesting artist. And that's where most of the metal covers were at that time, these kind of grotesque, very vivid, think of the cover of Altars of Madness um, or Beneath the Remains is a, one from that artist. 
these were covers that had a certain kind of like cartoonish look about them, even the death album covers, etc. And then you get a photograph of a pile of dead bushes and plants and a barren landscape on our cover. And I remember thinking, man, anyone walking into a record store is not going to know what to make of this album. As, as an advertising decision, I think it was disastrous. As an aesthetic choice, in retrospect, I found it, I find it somewhat interesting as an interpretation of Revenant, right? Um, by Nuclear Blast. And I like that about Nuclear Blast in the early days. They're a big label now, lots of big bands. But back then there was a sense of, ah, okay, give it a try. And I like that about Nuclear Blast back in, in the day. Um, or in the early years of Nuclear Blast, there was a sense that you could do what you wanted without being restricted by the, the laws of the scene, right? So yeah, I appreciate the question about, so my, my reply is yes, there's a sense of ecological catastrophe in the lyrics and the music, but no, we did not pick that album cover. They just, it was two different entities who, you know, came together on that. The band making the music and the lyrics and the label make, picking that album cover, which they chose from a, a catalog of photographs that were in the public domain. So they didn't pay anything for that, which was a good idea because the album didn't sell and they didn't waste money on the cover. <laughs> uh, that's a complete, complete shame. Well, yeah, it's, the, it's, you know, yeah. Then again, I will, in, in a sense, I would have lived another life and I'm pretty happy with the life that I have now. In fact, I'm very happy with it. Yeah, which, which is what counts. I mean, um, so, you know, after Revenant and all that, you, know, you, you went completely into academia, right? Studying until you got your PhD. Almost. It took a few years, Nick. Um, I left the band in January or February of 1995 we had all come to a crossroads. Uh, Tim left and moved to Florida. He joined Hate Plow, um, which is the band that he was in with the guys from Malevolent Creation. Um, Dave Django went, he started playing in more blues driven rock bands. Um, he played also for a time with Alan from Hades in a band. Um, they had a band together, Alan Tecchio from the metal band Hades, if you know them. Um, so Dave played with him and then he did more, more kind of a blues rock kind of bands. Think of early ZZ Top, that style of music. Um, Will also played in some bands locally, cover bands, stuff like that. Uh, I actually played in, in another band. We only made some four track demos that we never released. It was more of a kind of a ministry, like industrial metal type of band. I played in that band for about four months and then decided I just was, I didn't want, the, the band commitment was just too much time. And then um, later on, I joined up with our former drum tech and I played a set of songs with him for his birthday, uh, we played all covers of the band Clutch, which he loved very much and I do as well. And uh, we did that with some other local musicians, including one of the guys from Dog Eat Dog, if you know that band. So uh, there was a period of three or four years where I still popped into the music scene and, and fooled around a bit, but it wasn't for me any longer. I just loved it in my heart and missed it so that occasionally I would go in and get my fix, if I can use that metaphor. Um, but yes, I transitioned to academia. I, I worked on my master's degree beginning in 1994. I finished it in 1996. And then I went to work at the United Nations for two years. And I started teaching part-time. And in 1998, I applied to a, a big university and was accepted uh, to earn my doctorate at the University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I studied there for seven years 
moved back to New York. I finished my PhD on a fellowship at Columbia University. And I would add this, no matter where I went in the country to do my work, if I was in Pittsburgh those years, I saw friends from the old metal scene. Um, if I traveled to a conference somewhere, I would call an old friend from the metal scene and we'd go out and have a beer. So I, while my life and career changed direction dramatically, my roots in metal always were firm and it has always been a part of my life intellectually as well as culturally it's it's still there so, so yeah you don't imagine yourself um throwing away all your records saying ah oh, that was a waste of time i want to bet bigger better things now no never it was never a source of shame i'm i'm proud of it i just never thought that anyone would remember it so um that's why i'm grateful uh I still have all of my records, most of my demos, um, well, some of those, and uh, even some old sh band shirts from back in the day. I think I have one of the original Sepultura shirts from the 1980s. Oh, wow. That, that'd be insane. Morbid visions. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I have, yeah, I have quite a collection of vinyl from the 1980s that I'm sure most people would die to have at this point. <laughs> Um, you know, I have the original, speaking of Sepultura, a band who I have to say at a certain point influenced me more than any other band. And to this day, I still really admire a certain era of their music. Um, I haven't listened to them much lately, but I, um, I have the original Brazilian pressings from Cogumelo Records of those first three records up until schizophrenia when they were signed. I have schizophrenia on the original pressing. I used to trade records with a guy in Brazil. He would want American pressings of thrash, send him a box and he would send me a box of obscure Brazilian stuff. Um, you know, Atomica, Sepultura, these kinds of bands, Ratos de Foral and all these guys. Um, and I, that was the beginning of, of a long, and slow, slowly developing love affair with Brazilian culture that I've had ever since then. I've uh, branched out and I listen to other Brazilian music. Um, I've, I've just, I've just, yeah, it's a, life is crazy, man. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. It's funny because that you say that you like uh, Brazilian metal so much because it, you know you wrote lyrics like decaying in my silent grave you know I spoke to kings of hell's thrones whereas the Brazilians were like if you are false don't entry you will be burned and died in the nuclear fire <laughs> I consider you know your entire you know your professional career do you do you ever feel blocked sometimes by those lyrics no no um how could I say this? Um, in the early 2000s, when Revenant was, there was a period when we were completely forgotten and the internet had not yet become the engine of just global dominance that it is today in terms of information mm -hmm. and, mis and disinformation. Um, I noticed that there was still, I would occasionally get an email, like someone would find me in Pittsburgh and email my university account and say, hey, are you Henry from Revenant? I'd say, yeah, what of it? Like, who cares? And it's, well, I'm a big fan, you know, I'm from Slovenia, I'm from Australia, whatever. And I was just, I started thinking, I started getting a feeling that there were some people out there who remembered us. And as I transitioned from earning a PhD and working as a professor at a university, I realized, you know something, I'm going to talk about this experience, but I'm not gonna talk about it often. I'm just gonna say enough so that the historical record is clear and not to defend myself from anything. I did nothing wrong playing heavy metal, you know, some people, think, you know, think, oh, you were a heavy metal musician. Uh, you know, you slaughtered sheep in your yard and, and took a lot of drugs or whatever. You know, they have crazy ideas about this, right? 
and you know that may be true of some metal musicians, but it's not true of me, right, or us. And so it's not. It wasn't defensive. It was more okay. Let's talk about this because I will always affirm this about underground metal. Yes, and I'll use a term that I saw on the Hessian Firm website. I was reading your review of a noise record earlier today before we did this interview. And you use the term anti-music, the phrase anti-music, to describe a band, a Japanese noise band, KK, help um, me out. I can't remember. That was um, the Hessian Firm's editor, Raphael. Uh, yes. I, he, uh, what's the name of that band? Uh, KK. I know the one you're thinking of. Thinking yeah. of. Um, so I was listening to that album. You know, I was enjoying a bit of noise and reading through your website. And I came across that phrase. So I'll, I'll refer here to an essay that I read. And it was a moment of shock to me. I was at an academic conference. And if you've never been to an academic conference, it's a largely boring affair. And by boring, I mean, it's only by being bored that you can open yourself to that kind of intellectual stimulation and the meditative state that you really need to absorb dense theory and argument, et cetera, right? So when you're at an academic conference, like the one that I was at, you're, you're in a kind of otherworldly state and I was in between panels and I wandered into the hall where the vendors were selling books and I was browsing through some books in contemporary philosophy. And I came across a book about the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, yep. uh, a thinker who I've always admired greatly, a wonderful writer. His books on cinema, I've been rereading them for a course that I'm teaching and they're they're amazing, right? Uh, you know, his more famous books, Thousand Plateaus with uh, Guattari, those are great books. Very influential in certain areas of literary philosophy where I work. But I came across a book by a professor from on a university in Georgia, a guy named Ronald Bogues, who I'd never heard of at that point, B-O-G-U-E-S. And he wrote a book of essays about the philosopher Gilles Deleuze. And being interested in Deleuze, I picked it up, right? And I said, oh, let me see. It's in Deleuze's Wake, I think is the title. I pick it up, I'm flipping through it, and I see an essay entitled Becoming Metal. And I thought to myself, well, you know, Deleuze was interested in theories of inorganic matter, right? He, you know, he, he had these brilliant moments where he forayed into kind of like the cutting edge of his science of his era. And I said, becoming metal. Well, let me look at it. So I flip the book open and I see a full paragraph with a list of band names, Terrorizer, Carcass, Sepultura, Revenant. <laughs> and I thought fuck me like my band is in an academic book my old band and now i've got to buy the book right? take it home and read it i bring it home i read it and i think well this is interesting this is a you know someone who teaches philosophy trying to think through extreme metal in a matter in in at the level of sonic not experience, but material, as opposed to analyzing the lyrics, that chapter of the book is only about the, 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 the sound and I, the violence of the sound, right? <laughs> and the material density of that music that we make. And in the essay, he argues that this music becomes a way of rendering music inanimate. So back to your point about anti-music, 
it's instead of music breathing life into sound in the old romantic sense of the 19th century, here you have something, you know, anti-musical, anti-romantic. It's a deadening of sound, right? Mm. And I was, I was reading through this essay and I was finishing my PhD at the time. And I thought, you know, if anyone shows up and asks me about my old band, I'm going to answer questions about it and I'm going to be direct and forthright. And I'm going to talk about this music seriously, because while I was young, it was all fun and tours and parties and friends. Right. And let's, you know, there was a lot of mayhem when we were younger. In retrospect, I look back and I think, well, if the music did not have any appreciable aesthetic qualities, it would not have survived. It would not be a lasting art form. Here we are 40 years after the advent of, you know, some of the more extreme first extreme metal, right? And I'm thinking of like the early Sodom records and, you know, the early Slayer and things like this. And not only are some of these bands still playing, there's a whole other generation of musicians and artists carrying this music forward successfully and sometimes in really interesting ways. So I realized then that my training as, you know, I have degrees in philosophy and literature. My training in that, it clicked. I said, wait a second, I can look at this from the outside, but I also understand it from the inside. So I have this kind of bicameral view of it. And I thought, well, okay, let's talk about it. So I, I don't always have time for these kinds of longer interviews, but when I do them, I give them hell because I want people to think and appreciate, think about and appreciate that music in a way that isn't just, you know, let's go out and party, that sort of thing, which is all good if you're young, but when you get to a certain age, it's not that interesting. <laughs> like if I, if I went, if I went out to the bar and did what I was 22, what I did when I was 22 today, I'd be in an ambulance. So I have to, I have to find a way to enjoy it at another level. And thankfully I do. Yep. Yeah, and you know, I always like to ask at least one hard question. Uh, I cannot play devil's you, advocate a bit. Nick, and, you've already asked like five hard questions. <laughs> This time, I really want to push you because, you know, you have the kind of academic background for this. Um, you know, I think H.P. Lovecraft was always an incredible influence on metal. Yeah. But his his writing style is sometimes bland and it has this kind of like um, feeling that, you know, he's just kind of listing random entities. <laughs> you know, do you think that metal has to go beyond Love, Lovecraft now? Um, uh, you know, I'm going to say something here that's, I'm going to go back to another element of the underground that was very important for some of us in the New York scene. And I don't think I have ever mentioned this anywhere else. When we were younger, me, Scott Ruth from Ripping Corpse, Will Raymer from Mortician um, and other members of the scene, we were always at the horror film conventions in New York City. Uh, the Fangoria Magazine convention, the uh, Chiller Theater convention, these were conventions that, were, that became institutions. Um, and beginning in the late 1980s, we would run into each other there. And we weren't the only musicians going there. I mean, I regularly ran into and saw the guys from the Ramones, the guys from the Misfits, all these punk and rock bands from the area would hang out there. Everybody had their own scenes, but people knew each other. Hi, how you doing? This kind of thing. So there was a lot of common ground in our, that a lot of musicians, and I would say there were other bands that I could name. I'm not gonna list them all. We, we all found a common ground in this kind of like um, movie fan culture. But one of the things about those conventions that was so interesting was that they would bring in famous writers and directors as guest speakers. And one year, 
I was at the Fangoria Convention in Manhattan in New York City. It must have been 1991, 92, somewhere around there. And the British horror writer Clive Barker was speaking on stage. And someone asked him this same question about Lovecraft's style that you just asked, Nick. And I remember listening to Clive Barker's answer and thinking, Clive Barker is wrong about H.P. Lovecraft. But I was 20 years old and I didn't know much better. So I'm going to try with my memory of Clive Barker's answer to that question in mind. I'm going to try and answer your question and say this, you know, Iron Maiden has, a, has Lovecraft influences. Metallica, right? The thing that should not be. Yeah. Um, both Revenant and Ripping Corpse were, me and Scott Ruth, to this day, we still talk about Lovecraft's writings and read them, okay? Um, the guys in Morbid Angel, you know, Trey and David back in the day, they all, that's all we would talk about. So there was, there was this, there were these discussions that were always there. And some of that translated into music, right? So Lovecraft has had this, this, let's be frank, this unusually large influence on our music. This idea of, you know, cosmic horror and there are beings that existed so long before us that they threaten not just existence or life as we know it, but the very fabric of space and time. They can mutate that and destroy it and distort it and render it, you know, something like if you've seen the film Annihilation, they can just reprogram reality in some way so that our brains our little human brains can't even compute the magnitude of the terror that it would instill in us. And occasionally, you know, someone wanders into a place where there it is and they see it and they lose their minds. So this notion of like a spectacular insanity, insanity is very appealing to anyone interested in this kind of genre fiction, things like that. Now your question about style, Lovecraft as a writer was, I, I, I have to be careful here because he's, he, was, he was a product of the pulp era. His, his stories were written for pulp magazines, cheap throwaway magazines that nobody considered as having at that time as having any literary quality but the same was thought of you know the great noir detective writers raymond chandler dashiell hammett they also wrote for these cheap magazines that nobody took seriously right so i think at a basic kind of just at a the level of publishing heavy metal fans feel a deep kinship with any other artist that no one takes seriously. Why? Because nobody takes heavy metal seriously, right? Yeah. They make documentaries about it, making fun of heavy metal musicians. So nobody takes it seriously. And to some degree, you know, we might deserve it at times. That's fine. But that doesn't lessen our devotion to the form. With that being said, Step away, heavy metal, Lovecraft, the pulps, you know, chip on your shoulder sort of thing. You step away from that and you think, what kind of writer am I reading here? You know, if you read, Lovecraft belongs to a very long tradition of New England Gothic writers. It's Nathaniel Hawthorne and Stephen King and things like this. And they're all very different stylistically. Lovecraft's style is one that overwhelms you with verbosity, modifiers, adverbs, strange phrases, stitched together words. And I th I've always thought that the intention of that obtuse style was to render language monstrous in some way. Something, it's, he turns language into something ugly 
which is the point of the fiction, right? Um, the world he paints is an ugly world. And as a white patrician member of a certain class, he, he's afraid of this new monstrous world. And it comes out in other ways. He's a notorious racist, for example, right? So the language itself is meant to seem to provoke that feeling. Heavy metal is also <laughs> after some effects like that at time, right? It renders music monstrous. Back to that earlier point about anti-music. Thankfully, um, you know, some of Lovecraft's other tendencies have been left out of it. We emphasize the fantasy and dispense with some of the, you know, xenophobia, for example, that's in Lovecraft. And that's good. It's an interpretation of Lovecraft. I like the fact that heavy metal has drawn upon a writer, but there are certainly other writers that people could draw upon and maybe usefully. One of your own countrymen, Michel Helbeck, you know this guy? Oh, I, you know, honestly, if metal started taking from him, that would be, that would be pretty insane. I, I, mean, I read Submission about a year ago. Yeah, I've read that book. It's a crazy book. Um, the one that I admire is the fam the most famous one here in America, at least, is the Elementary Particles, the science fiction book. Oh yeah, yeah. that's a that that's a that's a book. That's a tremendous book. It's a great novel. But he his first book is a book of about Lovecraft. His first book he wrote a book about H.P. Lovecraft. I don't you know. That tells you something about his orientation as a writer in terms of his attraction to these grotesque as a form of literary sort of torture. <laughs> um, so I, he's another controversial figure who's fashioned himself in his own way within your national tradition as a kind of Lovecraftian weirdo, right? Um, I'm not saying that metalheads should read him. I don't find his work particularly interesting. Some of it's very good. Some of it I think is just boring, right? Yeah. Lovecraft, on the other hand, had a very short spectacular career in which he was very consistent at developing something that really no one had ever seen before, right? So I don't think anyone should not aspire to that. On the other hand, just copying Lovecraft is probably a bad idea. He, he's tiresome to read at times, um, to say the least. And maybe Clive Barker in his answer to the audience member, Clive Barker tore Lovecraft to pieces from the stage that day. And, you know, Clive Barker's an excellent writer and he's accomplished, but he has a completely different, much more sparing kind of style of writing. Um, so... Yeah, should metal move beyond Lovecraft? I think that that's as a, as a kind of guiding star of you know heavy metal content. Yeah, sure, why not move beyond it? But don't forget it, right? Uh, Lovecraft has taken a nosedive in terms of his reputation lately. There have been biographical elements that have really damaged, and they've always been there. I've always known them, um, but he's been kind of removed quietly from the canon of certain types of genre fiction. And um, that's just history. It just comes and goes in waves and, you know, he'll always have his readers and, you know, in the heavy metal scene, a lot of us took great, not satisfaction or solace, great inspiration from Lovecraft's weirdness. And I use that word in the sense that he uses it in his book, um, on fantasy literature, the one long work of literary criticism that he wrote. He describes the weird, it's not gothic, it's not horror, it's something else. Um, it's, it's more of an effect than a, a substance, and it's designed to get into your mind and change the way you think in any conventional way. The writer that he admired most, who I love a great deal, uh, is Lord Dunsany, the Irish uh, fabulist. Dunsany, Borges, uh, Calvino, 
these those are the true fantasy artists of the modern era. In my view, Lovecraft is a lesser artist. He didn't produce all that much, and most of it is kind of predictable. But uh, Lovecraft did no talent when he saw it, and he saw it in Dunsany, Lord Dunsany of Ireland, uh, a wonderful writer who has also been an inspiration to some musicians, Led Zeppelin, to name one band uh, who drew from uh, Dunsany. So. I think that, you know, when you talk about the general, the bigger question here is who are the literary influences on, on extreme metal and, you know, what should we do about them? I don't know. You know, you just read things, you enjoy them, you take what you want. When I was young, I hung around a bookstore in my town with my bandmates and we bought all kinds of stuff. The, the, the writer who influenced me even more than Lovecraft was the British writer, Michael Moorcock. Uh, the fantasy writer, who was associated with Hawkwind and Lemmy and Motorhead too. Oh yes, fantastic book, the uh, Elric of Melnibone. So. Yes, that that cycle, the Elric cycle, was amazing, um, and some of his other books are quite good too. And he's a he's just a great guy. I used to read about him in Heavy Metal magazine, and those books were perhaps more of an influence on me than anything that I read when I was younger, when I was shaping and my bandmates and I were shaping the kind of revenant idea. Um, those are great books. And, um, but, you know, they belong to the, another era of pulp fiction, that of the seventies, right? Um, the British produced a lot of great writers in that time, Nick, but I'm running on at the mouth. You've drawn out the professor, Henry. Yeah. And I'm going to stop now. No, it's very good. I mean, you've got me uh, going now because, you know, we you started, you mentioned, uh, you know, Borges, who I absolutely love for, for his short stories. I think they're absolutely frightening. And he's got some certain, certain kind of like mathematical and knowledge of uh, <laughs> that he, can, he kind of twists to make his short stories. But I really want to get to um, Moorcock and because... You know, no, before Elric of Melnibone, I don't really remember many morally gray stories because, you know, now like in TV and books and everyone, you know, ever since Game of Thrones came out or The Wire, Breaking Bad, everyone wants to kind of morally gray. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's insane how Elric never took off because, you know, I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't uh, read, read any of the books, but he does have a weird tendency of killing the people he loves the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You see that there's another cycle of books that he wrote. I can't remember the name of it. I remember the covers now. I haven't read them in so long. Um, and you see that there as well. And there's more of a kind of, you know, something comparable. It, whereas Elric is more of a fantasy warrior fiction in the in the tradition of Conan. Um, this other series of books was more in that kind of Game of Thrones tradition. And those are two, they're writers who started their careers around the same time. Uh, writing for the pulp magazines of the 70s and 80s, um, Heavy Metal, and also um, Omni Magazine was a big one in the 80s for me. And that's where a lot of those writers also published their work in Omni uh, Magazine. So these, those kind of what you call these morally gray, yeah, um, yeah, what was the question though? Were you asking me about Borges and that, or I'm not sure. I was asking you like, why did that never take off, you know, instead oh. of the, always evil winning or, you know, good yeah. vanquishing evil? Well, I, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, what, why didn't it take off at the time? Well, first of all, those books and those writers were limited to a certain audience. Um, you could not make a, 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 a worthy film adaptation or TV adaptation in the 1970s or 80s of Game of Thrones or Elric of, Elric of, of Melnibone and these kinds of books, right? They were technically the visual media were not as sophisticated as the literary media, but today they are. So now you see these Televisual media, you know, adapting. I hear that Elric is going to be adapted now. It's it's in the works, and I'm a little worried about it because I hope they don't screw it up. In my mind, 
that world is incredibly weird, right? Yeah. Um, Moorcock's world. But if you look at some of the other British science fiction writers who've had their work adapted recently, it's been good. It's been good stuff. My daughter's been reading, um, um, not Neil Postman, uh, the other guy who, uh, uh, I forget his name. It was a TV series recently. Um, and not Pullman either. Um, it's another writer. I, the name escapes me. It was made into a, a mini series recently. Um, he's another great writer of that Moorcock era. And they're being rediscovered now, just like we rediscovered Lovecraft in the 80s when those Del Rey books came out. Now a new generation of readers rediscover Moorcock and these great British sci-fi writers because they're seeing them on TV in these good adaptations. Think of Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. Like that was a tremendous adaptation and people went back and started reading the books. Well, those books had been around, yes, they did well, but that, you know, he, George Martin had been around for decades. Nobody paid much attention to George Martin in the 70s and 80s. And then, you know, he gets success. Why? Because, well, the, the other media have caught up to the quality of the literary work that these guys were, that these writers were producing. So I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated question, but that's something about the world that we inhabit. That, and you mentioned this earlier about music. You know, there's a new generation of metalheads that are going back and mining the 80s and 90s and tearing it apart and, you know, putting it back together in different ways. Um, culture has always been something of a cannibal in that way. It, you know, it eats itself and then it turns into something different. Um, there's something wondrous about that. There's also exploitation and a, a bleak side to it as well. But, you know, uh, when it comes to my own band, it, if you think of the history of Revenant, we went from, you know, an interesting, somewhat marginal band to being completely forgotten. And then in the last decade or so, there have been reissues of our music and people write to us and we have that Facebook page that is a bit of a legacy page, but I'm always amazed by the quality of the comments and the devotion to the music. That's, that's amazing. Look, we just spent a year trapped in our homes. People around us have died. I've, people I know in the scene have died. Uh, Brian from Buffalo, who did the Glorious Times book with Alan Moses. COVID fucking killed him, man. Like he died. Like this is this has been a bad year for music, for culture, for the economy, for everything, for education, everything. And let's not forget that, you know, the world we had before this was a rich and interesting place, ugly at times too. But that's something that we all have to fight for. That's why I affirm what we did and what everyone else does, and why I applaud you for having such a, you know, an, uh, 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 an original website with good articles and a, a high quality of writing, because it doesn't have to be stupid. Stupid is, is you know, that's, that's when you don't have culture. You have garbage. And you don't want that. We've seen what the world looks like when it's, when it's bad. So... You know, um, it's important for, for all of us to recognize at a moment such as this, when we've had a lot of time to think, though I'm afraid some haven't taken advantage of the opportunity as, as others have, to really appreciate the simple pleasure of going to a show and drinking a beer and listening to Terrorizer on stage and Pete the Feet tearing through a song and thinking, oh my God, that man has been playing drums like, like he has nuclear radiation flowing through his veins for 40 years. How does he do that? How does an old guy play drums like Pete Sandoval? He is a living miracle. So when I go to a, the next show that I go to, 
I'm gonna drink cold beer and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna appreciate that moment. I don't care who's on stage because I miss it very much. The absence of that kind of cultural activity in a public sense where you go out and hear the music and see your friends and and buy a t-shirt and have a meal with a, with someone man not having that is awful so i hope that people will, will get back to that and appreciate and not take culture for granted or the people who make it i'm not sure if i answered your question but that's what i have to say <laughs> Yeah, anyway, you know, <laughs> I know this is a long shot, but I'm going to try it at least. Go for how, it. How about uh, a Revenant comeback album? No. <laughs> uh, no, 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 it won't happen. First of all, let me say this. There is a geographic problem. Um, Dave Django lives in California. I live in North Carolina, Will lives in New Jersey, Tim lives in Sweden. Now, as fate or irony would have it, one of my original bandmates, John McEntee, lives about 45 minutes away from me here now. And we've seen each other since he moved here. Um, the more likely possibility would be that John and I would get together and play some of the songs. However, John has already done that. Incantation covered a Revenant song about 10 years ago, right? He, one of the songs that he wrote before he left the band. So that's not going to happen. My The last time I ever sang metal, right? And I, I know you wanted to talk about the vocals, my vocals. If you ever have a moment, listen to the Dim Mock record, Knives of Ice. Yeah, I spoke to Sean Kelly uh, recently. He told, he told me to oh, check yeah? it out. Yeah. yeah, my old friend Sean, he's a great guy. So I, I, I contributed vocals on a number of tracks on that record. That was in 2003, I think it was. And speaking of Lovecraftian songs, there's a great one on there, The Incident at the Temple of Lang. Scott Ruth is a master lyricist. Let me put that on the record. He's one of the great metal songwriters of all time, bar none, period. He is a storyteller in the metal sense of the word. And that is the best of all of the Lovecraftian inspired lyrical ventures is that song. Um, that's a great album from front to back. It's an amazing record. It took me about two weeks to recover from practicing and then recording that. And I said, never again, because I have to talk a lot as a professor. Mm. As you can tell, I'm very, you know, I, I conversational. And you see, I don't just talk with my mouth. I'm Italian, so I talk with my hands. So conversation, interaction is very tiring as you get older. So. It took me a while to recover. And occasionally the other guys and I will joke and we'll say, oh, we'll make a, a, you know, let's get together, have a reunion. I think it would be foolish. I think I'd probably die or be permanently disabled if I tried to do it. And I don't play the guitar as much as I used to. In fact, I rarely play it at all any longer. So um, it would take me years to bring myself back to that sort of performative athleticism <laughs> that you need to play death metal at that speed. So I, I just, I think geographically and technically it's out of the question, maybe even physically. Um, but I will say this, I still write lyrics. I, here. I have in my phone, just files and files of notes and complete songs. Here, let me find a good one for you. Here's one. So some of these I send to friends. 
I'm going to read this verbatim, Nick. Oof. These are not revenant lyrics, but they are metal lyrics, just to be clear. I wrote this and sent it to a friend of mine that uh, we're always joking about asteroids. <laughs> <laughs> they're coming okay so these are my lyrics about an asteroid impact this is untitled i have other ones i have titled i ha mind you nick i have notebooks filled with these and my phone must have dozens of lyrics they're getting closer the planets shift to clear a path a stellar highway configured like some kind of math. The ancients knew it. They sang of how the day would come when night would die, burning like a million suns. The signals reach me all the time, waves of metal in the sky. Then in parentheses, I have blast beat radio static. I was raking leaves when the message fell like rain deep space convoy dragging mountains in its train into the bunker that I dug in the yard, into the bunker as the first one hits the car. The signals reach me all the time, waves of metal in the sky, blast beat radio static. Days and weeks, months and years, pasty skin, Orion's tears, Pink Floyd was right about the moon. Pork and beans will run out soon. I break the seal that leads me to where the leaves once fell. There is a light. It gives me hope that all is well. My last step falls. It rises with its neck uncurled. The egg has cracked as it surveys its new home world. The signals reached us all the time, waves of metal in the sky. They sent their young to nurseries, cloaked in steel, they swarm like bees, blast beat, radio static. People think I'm lying. The professor doesn't make metal anymore. Uh, those those could honestly be on a on like a class like I mean one of the higher end uh, death metal bands of the nineties. <laughs> you should commission them out. <laughs> yeah, you know those aren't typical Revenant lyrics. It's a bit of science fiction. There's a humorous moment. Yeah, but in a way they are Revenant lyrics. The world is ending. Aliens have arrived. I mean, not, not quite as verbose, you know. You no, know, no, you're missing the big words. <laughs> yes, the, I've gotten away from the Lovecraftian verbosity of it. That's great. I mean, is there anything you want to talk about? You know, we've been at this for almost two hours. You know, I think we've gone through a lot of stuff. Um, I'm looking at my notes because as an academic, I'm always prepared. Um, <laughs> And you had sent me when we emailed, you had asked me um, a question about um, metal nowadays. And it's the kind of question I don't know how to answer. You've, we've talked about it briefly here. And I just want to address it in this way. My sense of what extreme metal has become is like, it's like the internet, you can find anything. There's just incredible diversification. It's impossible to categorize or difficult to categorize a lot of bands. I remember I went to see Cannibal Corpse play here. They played in my city where very few metal bands come to play and they, uh, Cattle Decapitation was the opening band. And I had never seen them or heard much about them. My God, like I didn't know what, you know, three songs into that set, I was completely blown away. I just couldn't believe how good they were. 
And I thought, what is this? Like, it's grind core, it's death metal. It has, you know, some kind of ideological element that seems to be very disturbing um, in terms of their just in, intense sort of environmentalism, right? Um, and I remember leaving that concert and thinking, man, you know, I went to see some old friends play and hang out with the guys in Cannibal. We've known each other since we were kids almost. And I walked away from there having learned something new that there were these amazing bands doing innovative work. I still listen, I still try to find music to hear people send me things and I'm always happy to hear it. But for me, the metal scene these days is it's just so fractured back in you know 40 years ago everybody knew everybody like literally we knew everybody else like everybody knew everyone else you were either pen pals or you traveled to shows together or you met at festivals you know i think of those first milwaukee festivals that they had back in the early 90s we went there we played with atheist immolation all these cynic was there we just knew everybody. Well, even when you went there, you knew the guys because you'd been exchanging letters for years and demo tapes and things like that. Now, the scale and fragmentation of the scene is so unbelievably complicated. And in my view, just, you know, it's sublime in the sense that, you know, the old poets used to use the word it's terrifying and beautiful at the same time. There's no way to comprehend what's going on any longer. Yes, it's metal, but there are a lot of bands, so many bands out there that they all seem to be mining this old music in different ways and going off in different directions. So I have to say, pardon, bless you. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna quote your enemies. Gesundheit. Um, uh, where was I? Yeah, the, the fragmentation of the scene is an awesome thing to behold. So rather than get into specific bands, I do want to say this. As an old veteran of the metal scene, but as someone you know who hasn't really been part of it as a musician in 25 years, but who was there at the beginning and really got to see a lot of amazing things early on, either when we toured in Europe or here in the States or just hanging around at shows all over the place. Um, I have to say that I'm incredibly impressed with the variety of what's out there, but I'm even more impressed by the level of just care that people use to just describe the music now Back, if you read old fanzines, and I have to say, like, there were some exceptions, like uh, Scott Helig's fanzine um, from Philadelphia, Borvoy Kurgan's uh, magazine, they were very, they were written a little more carefully than most fanzines, right? Um, most fanzines were just, you know, demo tapes on paper. They were very messy, right? I have to say that the level of sophistication and diversity in the music is finally has a match in the level of just almost scholarly interest that people like you take in the music. And I think that's amazing. I'm so, that's one thing that I'm so impressed by. Not that, not only that the music is so crazy and diverse, but Another, a new generation of fans has found a way to talk about that in a way that makes sense. Because, you know, I'm out of touch a bit. I can't make sense of it. So I count on you now to make sense of it for me. I'm the original gangster, but now I come to younger fans for guidance. And I'm really appreciative of that. And I hope it continues because like I said, a world without music, even crazy, loud, abrasive music, it's a pretty sad world, right? Um, it's a boring place. And I've been sitting at home listening to a lot of Motorhead for the last year. And 
I'll never get tired of that. But you can sit at home and listen to Motorhead all day and it's fine. But you go out to a bar or just take a ride in your car and turn it up, it's much better. You know? Yeah, so, I felt that, yeah. Even when you hear a metal song on the radio, it just sounds better, you know, between all yeah. the pop stuff. It's like, yeah, that's one of us, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, what I was saying about, about the scene today, yeah, there are bands I could mention. I'm really impressed with some of them. They're great. Uh, there's one French band I particularly admire. Um, but I, I have to say that... Uh, it's the level of discussion has changed around the music. And that's what's really impressed me. And I think that maybe that explains why people have remembered Revenant um, and, you know, learned to appreciate the music because, you know, we were a little different and it takes a certain level of, uh, you know, it sounds so stupid when I say it, not sophistication, but it, it takes a certain level of determination to learn how to enjoy complicated bands like my old band right oh, you yeah, have definitely. to be persistent <laughs> yeah you, you know it, it surprises me um you might not know this but a lot of the younger metalheads they go from you know rock music or rap even straight into death metal you know there's no iron maiden there's no slayer you know <laughs> there's wow. that's a shame they've skipped over several impo important steps if they missed out on iron maiden Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you know, there's one really big question I want to ask you. I know you've said no to this in the past, but uh, the problem is, you know, on Discogs of uh, the prof prophecy CDs, the original ones tend to be overly expensive. You know, I'm talking forty, fifty dollars for a jewel case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you ever consent to a reissue of prophecy? Um. Uh, I'll, I'll say this here um, for the first time. Um, my bandmates and I have been talking about it for years. Here is what happened. We, the reason we have, we, we let Cosmic Key reissue the album on vinyl four years ago. And now Dave has, Dave at Extreme has reissued the two seven inch singles. Um, and those are really nice. They're beautiful presentations of the music. Um, the reason we, we have done some of these small licensing ventures was to accumulate a bit of money so that we could reissue the CD at some point. However, there's a technical problem. The original nuclear blast pressing of that music there was something wrong i don't know what the hell happened i have a recording of the album on cassette that's that was taken from the original master tapes in the studio so it's an unmastered recording of the record and it sounds so much better than the mastered version I don't know why that happened. I don't know what technology is to blame. If someone spilled their coffee on the fucking machinery that pressed up the, the record, I don't know what happened. Prophecies of a Dying World was, we spent more time record than we did recording it. And that's why some of the performances are a bit shitty by our standards, because we really wanted to make it sound good. One of the things about that record, you can't even really hear it, is that there's a lot of layering of the guitar tracks. If you listen closely to Prophecies of a Dying World, the title track, the bass and both guitars are doing three different things during the verse of, those so of that song. Those are really complex guitar tracks. And for some reason, they just didn't, it just didn't come across well. It didn't sound good. So we were always disappointed in the audio presentation of that music. I don't know what happened. The only way to solve that problem is to go back to New Jersey where the master tapes are stored, recover those and transfer them 
in a process called baking the tapes, where basically they, they literally bake the tape in a special oven and then dump it into a digital file with the 24 tracks intact, right? Yeah. It's an expensive process, but we always wanted to reissue the CD in a, a form that more closely captured the original mix. I don't know what happened to that CD. I, I just, it's just something doesn't sound right to me on that album. And the only way to determine whether or not that can be fixed is to get the master tapes. So this year is the 30th anniversary of that album's release. Plan was to go and, I was gonna go up and look at the tapes, but I'm restricted from travel. I can't leave the state. I'm a university professor. Um, they need me here. I have a family, my mother's elderly. I, I've, I can't risk traveling and coming back and then ending up on a ventilator. I can't do it. And I talked to my bandmates about it and we decided that we would just put the entire project on hold. So to answer your question, Nick, the possibility of a prophecies reissue is not only likely, it's going to happen one day, but we will only do it on conditions that meet our specifications regarding the best possible audio presentation of the music. Because once that album is re-released, that's it. We're finished. We're not gonna release anything else. The music has had great presentations. Extreme did a great job with the compilation that they released 15 years ago. Um, Cosmic Key did a great job with the vinyl, the seven inches that were, that's it. It's not a big catalog of music. It would be unethical to milk it for money. So we would only do that if it were done correctly. However, the pandemic prevented us not only from traveling, I should also say this, out of respect, one of my, the, the master tapes are sitting in the house of one of my bandmates, parents, and they are elderly. So we couldn't risk going there and exposing them to contagion. Now that may change in the next few months as we get vaccinated and hopefully things start to ease up. But by then, you know, the, the, the timeline will have shifted and it would not be a 30th anniversary release. So one day we hope that it will be released properly on the CD. And there is actually, there are a few surprises that we have in store for that. I'm not gonna give everything away, but I do have, there is one Revenant song, a demo of a song that has never been released. And I have a decent copy of it and we would include that as a bonus track. And when people hear it, they're gonna say, oh my God, what the fuck is going on? It's an awesome song. Um, it's a song that we wrote in the last year, year and a half. We were very slow songwriters and then we had to practice a lot to make the songs play them well. But this is an awesome song. And if we ever, when we re-release Prophecies, we would include this song. It's called the, A New Paganism. We would include that song as a kind of a farewell gift to all of the fans. We're just holding back on it. The other thing that might happen is that there is an instrumental demo cassette of the original lineup that has never been released and that might also be included. There's a third surprise, but I'm not gonna say anything about it. <laughs> I'm already salivating at the first two. <laughs> yeah, those are. that's something I hope that, that, that we will manage to pull that off. And we would do that only if it were if we could find a way to do it the right way. Everyone is always asking us to release the CD. We're flattered, we're grateful, um, but we're not doing this quickly. We're gonna do it correctly when it happens. So uh, the answer to your question is yes, we, we plan to re-release it on a CD with some bonus material one day, 
but the pandemic restricted us from accessing the master tapes of the recording for the time being. I spoke with Dave Jengo about it not long ago, and we're going to try again soon. I mean, that's that's very admirable because you know, a lot of the the hype around the kind of the early '90s death metal will have to fade. You know, it, you're probably not going to make as much money as you would if you release it now in its current form. So it, it's I don't, uh, look, Nick. I, I I don't care about the money. We never made a lot of money as a band. When we toured in Europe with Gorefest, we played. 25 shows something like that in 30 days the shows were well attended we played shows with punch and stench and napalm death gore fest tour, did the whole tour with us um i would say 85 to 90 percent of the shows were either sold out or close to that we had good crowds at those shows there were a few tuesday night shows where there were only like 50 people there but for the most part, we had really strong attendance in Europe. We sold some merchandise. Somehow, you know, we came home from that tour and we had to repay this money. We had to repay that. And this guy needed money and the artist who did the shirts needed their money. And before I knew it, you know, I barely had anything left. I thought, man, you actually could lose money touring if you were, weren't careful. What did we do? We went back on tour the next day. So we never we never made the music for the money. We did it. We 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 were young and fortunate enough to be alive at a time when you didn't need a whole lot of money. You just needed enough to get by, and we could make music for the sake of music. And that's it. that's all we needed, and that's that's a very rare and beautiful thing. And if there are any young people out there listening. Don't fucking do it just for the money. Do it because you love it and you mean it and you really want to make something that's valuable. Now, you might not make anything valuable, but at least fucking try and do it. That's what's important. And, you know, later on, if you get rich, good for you. If you don't, okay, that's fine too. You're still going to find a way to survive, I hope, right? Yeah. So this is that I do want to stress that point. We would never release it for the money because frankly, it's not going to sell a lot of copies. We were an obscure band, a difficult band with a limited audience. We would just do it for the people like we did with Overman. We pressed up 300 copies and we gave them away to friends for free. Whoa. You know, we're not Metallica. We don't have to worry about paying the lawyers. Yeah. You know, at this point, we're just grateful anyone listens to it. Here, have the music. So, you know, um, I appreciate that question, though. Thank you. Yeah. So I think that that just about, you know, closes up anything else, you know, any closing statements, anything else. Uh... You want to add? No, man, I'm going to ask you a little favor of you um, while you're over there in Europe. As you know, I am proudly Italian. Yeah. My, my family, I'm, I'm the child of immigrants and refugees. My mother barely speaks English. We are, I'm 100%, I have an Italian, I'm a European citizen and I have an Italian passport. Just to be clear, I know everybody has been looking at America for the last few years and saying, what the hell is going on? We look at everybody else and we ask, what the hell is going on? Let me just say this. Everybody, we have a chance now. Everybody has a chance right now over the next few months and years to get their fucking act together, right? So whatever it is that you have to do in France, and my friends in Italy have to do, and someone listening in Russia or Sweden or China or Australia or whatever anyone has to do, my closing comment is this, do it. Because life is short. 
there's one lesson, moral lesson <laughs> in death metal music. The end <clears throat> is near, brother. No matter what you do, it's coming. You will lose this fight. There's an epistemological fact at the core of all extreme metal. You will not live for long. That's the, the existential core of the music, right? Yeah. Now, there are all these fantastic deaths and weird themes and all that kind of stuff that we think about zombies and devils and all of that, or, you know, the apocalypse and, you know, other weird stuff that you hear about in the music. But strip away all the fantasy. The core lesson is there. Please, everybody, be safe. If the people who are in charge of running your country are doing a bad job of it, vote the bastards out and replace them with capable, intelligent people who aren't going to let this happen again. Because the music industry, and I was watching the Grammys last night, the music industry is suffering. My friend Paul, who was a sound, he was Cannibal Corpse's sound engineer for years. He has suffered a lot through all of this. He can't tour, no one's touring. So yeah, support the scene, support the band, support the artists. But when, when everything's back up and running, and let's hope it's soon, really don't forget what this was like for those artists. They suffered a lot. They didn't have money and careers and things like that. And more importantly, the engineers, the roadies, the promoters, the bouncers, the bartenders at the clubs that we love to go to, don't ever take them for granted again. Thank them when you see them. Give them as big a tip as you can afford because those people are important too, the workers who make music possible. And they've, they've had a really hard time this last year. Those are my closing thoughts. Don't forget what a world without live music is like. It sucks. So when it comes back, make sure that you appreciate it and support it the way it deserves to be supported. Not because Henry said so, but because that's how we're going to all survive into the future with good music. All right. Thank you very much, Henry. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Thank you uh, to Hessian Firm also. I love what you guys are doing with your project. Uh, keep it going. And, you know, I'm, I'm humbled and flattered to be on here. Now, we are yeah. humbled to have an actual death metal legend. <sighs> legend. Yeah. All right. No, you know uh, what? I'll tell you a I'm funny story. Consideration. We know a bunch of people who've made the ultimate list of all metal, right? Of every single metal band ever, like not, but like the, the actual best ones. Revenant ranked in at like eight or nine, which I think might be a little low, but is it, you know, in the history of the what 100, 200,000 death metal bands that they have been, that, that's a that's that's really where I would have Revenant somewhere in the top 10 easily. Well, I'm really flattered. They, if I were to make my own list, Revenant wouldn't even make the top 20. But but there's one song, one Revenant song that still kills me, and I wish I could play it one more time, and it's The Burning Ground. I'm very proud of that song. I mean, honestly, you should be proud of every song. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, Nick. Thanks, man. You made an old man's day. Thank you, Henry.